When I did my series on the evolution of snakes, I included a reference to Semitic mythology, wherein the very first of all serpents angered the Jewish god, Jehovah, who then took away the serpent's legs, saying that it and all its future descendants were cursed to crawl on their bellies from then on. So there you have the mythical origin of snakes, where all the different serpent families we have now evolved from the one common ancestor, the original serpent in the garden. And now that we're talking about the evolution of spiders, I should reference another similar and equally silly origin story in Greek mythology, which says that the maiden Arachne was so good at weaving fabric that it made the goddess Athena jealous. So Athena cursed Arachne, turning her into the first spider, so that she and all her future descendants would continue to weave their silk, just not with human hands. Such are the tales folks tell when they don't know any better and they just want to be entertained by hidden messages and supposed morals and sacred fables they made up. Of course, now we know that snakes are a group of highly specialized lizards without legs, and that spiders are a group of highly specialized arachnids without tails. At least the modern ones don't have tails anymore. There is a fossil group called Trigonotarbida with a number of species dating to the late Silurian and early Permian periods that look like spiders and they don't have tails. But the resemblance is largely superficial. They're a generalized group, almost as much like mites as they are like spiders. Similarly, there is a carboniferous arachnid called Plesiosiro, a haptopod that again looks like a spider at first glance, but it isn't. It's considered transitional or intermediate between the two main forms of arachnids. And one of Plesiosiro's notable features is its chalicerae is in two parts, as they usually are, with a rigid thumb-like appendage braced against a flexible fang. If the thumb part is lost or reduced, then it's just a stabbing fang. This gets us into the clade of tetrapulmonata. The most notable feature of that group is that they typically have two pairs of book lungs. Within this group is another subset called pedipalpi, wherein there are a number of other arachnids that look a lot like spiders, and some of which still have tails, including both the long and short-tailed whip scorpions. The schizomid subset barely has any tail left, but it's there. They have one, even if it's just a tiny vestige. It's funny to me when some science denialist says that there's no vestigial features or transitional species, because when you study taxonomy, like we're doing now, then you can't help but see myriad examples of each. Intermediate forms are everywhere, especially when you include fossils. Then there's no way to avoid them. Now remember that a transitional species refers to an intermediate form, perhaps a basal one, but not necessarily an ancestral one. Now for a few more examples, let's step away from Schizotarzata and look at their sister group, Sericodiastida, named for the Greek word for silk workers, because these species all have spigots for producing silk. Well, there is a primarily Carboniferous collective that is tentatively considered to be part of this clade because they look so much like spiders, but they don't show any evidence of silk glands yet. And curiously, they don't have tails either. And most arachnid groups lost their tails independently because they don't really do anything, except in the case of scorpions, of course. So it's not surprising that one offshoot of spider-like critters would have lost their tails too, even if the ancestors of true spiders still retained that feature a while longer. But it's unlikely to have lost something so useful as the ability to make silk. Although you can lose something useful and still function. In fact, one lineage of these proto-spiders from the Carboniferous are known for their loss of eyes. And maybe they were strictly nocturnal or only lived in caves, who knows? Uh, that makes things like Admonarachne a taxonomic enigma. It's definitely a proto-spider, albeit not an ancestral one. But it, does it really belong in this group? Or should it be in a basal sister clade alongside it? Or in a parent clade above it? And we could create a new clade and call it, what? Yeah, we can't call it Arachnomorpha, that's taken. Uh, Araniomorpha is taken too. Should we call it spider morph? Spider morph. I like the sound of that. No, I can't call it that. You've got to use a Latin name unless you name it after a person. In this case, we're trying to name something that has many of the attributes of a spider, and it's kind of trying to be a spider, so... Yeah, let's call it Parker Morpha. Not seriously. Even if we call it Araniaforms, we need a new clade, a subset of Tetrapulmonata that would include everything that looks exactly like a spider, even if it's not quite a complete spider yet, so that Sericodiastida would still be the subset of those spider forms that make silk. And I suggest this because there is another Carboniferous clade of tailless protospiders that were, I think, erroneously misclassified as spiders by a pioneer scientist a century or so ago, despite the fact that they too have no evidence of silk glands. 
Now, I understand why he said this. We don't have the genome for extinct animals, so there's no way to know for sure. All we had was fossils to go by, and the fossils that were known at that time would lead one to that conclusion. But if silk production is a required criteria for spiderhood, as the clade name Seracadiastida implies, then the old tree should be reconfigured accordingly to account for that and to include all these quasi-spiders as sister groups in an enveloping parent clade, regardless whether they have tails or make silk or not. Because a lot of arachnids look like spiders, and several of them have shed their useless tails, but how often does anything gain the ability to make silk? Now, different types of silk were developed differently in a couple sets of insects and in one line of mites, but that's it. It doesn't occur in any other animal, so that is decidedly more rare, and not likely to occur independently, especially not in such closely related groups. Although their embryology shows that spiders develop silk production via both systemic and surficial pathways. Spider silk is amazing stuff, much stronger than the flimsy material silkworms make. Pound for pound, spider silk is five times stronger than steel, and twice as elastic as nylon, and it's even tougher than Kevlar. It has actually even been used to make ballistic body armor. Think about that. You put on a vest made of spider web, and somehow it's bulletproof? And there was an aerospace company who thought that the way to the future was to build a fuselage of airplanes out of lightweight, flexible spider silk. The problem with that is that spiders don't produce very much silk individually. To get enough to build an airplane, you need millions of spiders, all in separate enclosures. It would be way too expensive and time-consuming. What you need for industrial production of spider silk is a herd of these things, where each animal would have to be way bigger than any spider ever. But not only do we not have the technology to make giant spiders, fortunately. But even if we could, it wouldn't work because spiders are loners and they tend to kill each other when confined in close quarters. And they'd kill us too whenever we try to milk the silk out of them. So a few scientists came up with the only reasonable solution to the problem. Take a golden orb weaver, because they're pretty big, and insert its web-making genes into the genome of a goat to make spider goats that produce silk instead of milk. You're going to have to bottle feed the babies from us some other stock because you're going to whip that goat web into biosteel. It's, it's an ingenious plan, and it's the only rational thing to do. <laughs> but if you're not a genetically modified monster from a madman's laboratory in a science factual horror story, if you're just a natural animal, then the ability to make spider silk defines what a true spider is. So all of these other silkless semi-spiders are just increasingly spider-like transitional forms, intermediate between the general tetrapulmonata and its subset, Seracodiastida, which includes both true spiders, Aranea, and another fossil group of stem spiders, or almost spiders, called Uranida, many of which retained that flagella-like tail. And this clade has two subsets, including the Permian permarachne and the Devonian atercopus. At 386 million years old, Atercopus is the earliest known example of a silk-producing spider, and it's not quite a spider yet because it doesn't have all the criteria. And one thing that all of these stem spiders and or quasi-spiders have in common is the type of chelicerae, which are, are like the human jaw being split into two halves so that they're able to chew from both sides alternately. In most arachnids, the chelicerae have little sensory hairs on them called setae, but in this group, the chelicerae are naked and smooth which makes them more effective as piercing fangs. And most arachne have their chelicerae in this position, like a gateway into the mouth. In others, they're in this position to feed off of the substrates. But in serachidiastids, they're in this position with the fang pointing down, or at least in a 45 degree downward angle. And the thumb part of the chelicerae may or may not be there. And so some of these had pincher-like chelicerae and some of them only had fangs. Except that the fangs in these earliest forms don't show evidence of a channel for venom to flow through. If they had venom, it would have begun as a component of digestive saliva that other chelicerates already use, where later generations added more digestive enzymes or paralyzing poisonous proteins. And of course, each lineage would develop its venom independently, blindly experimenting with a range of different options of hematoxins, neurotoxins, or what have you, whatever works. Then, as we've seen in the evolution of venomous snakes, once they have an effective venom, then there's a need to improve its delivery, and that results in a groove down the tooth, which in vipers and elapids eventually became a hollow channel for quantities of venom to be pushed through under pressure, like a hypodermic needle. And spiders evidently followed that same evolutionary course. So uraranidids were almost spiders, 
In fact, if they were alive today, I'm sure that we would call them and all of these others spiders too, whether tailed spiders or tailless spiders, regardless whether they have venom or silk. But we would recognize that they were just a different set than we're used to, a separate group distinguished from the silk producers that we call true spiders. So what exactly is a true spider? It's everything we just described with one more feature. Instead of just having silk spigots, which can be used to build nests and wrap their eggs together and put hinges on trap doors, things like that, true spiders also have an adapted appendage called spinnerets to weave the silk into a variety of useful fabric. So what is the most primitive form that actually is a true or complete spider? Well, the most basal one found so far is the Cretaceous chimerarachne from 100 million years ago. It's classified as a separate suborder, a stem group, but it's basically a spider. These long pointy things coming off the abdomen have been identified as rudimentary spinnerets. If so, then it's yet another nice example of a transitional intermediate form because these spinnerets are so primitive, they're like an unrefined prototype. And plus, the chelicerae of chimerarachne still have enough of the thumb part to operate as pinchers, so they're not quite fangs, or, yet, or they're not just fangs anyway. And of course, the most obvious feature that makes it a perfect example of a transitional form is that chimerarachne is the only spider yet known that still has flagellum. The telson or tail seems to have performed some stabilizing function in their marine relatives, but not so much for the ones living on land probably because they're more flexible, being smaller, lighter, and not encumbered by all that heavy segmented armor. The abdominal armor is thinner on arachnids than it was on eurypterids or horseshoe crabs, but notice how the segmented plates are still present on scorpions and solifuges and nearly all other arachnids. You might think they're not there on spiders because most modern spiders don't have that anymore, but fossil spiders had them, and there's one lineage of primitive spiders that still have them, albeit as a vestige of what they once were. These are Mesothelae, a suborder of a hundred or so surviving species that are now found only in Southeast Asia, where their fossil forms used to be widespread from Ukraine to Illinois. They're not as old as they're made out to be, though, because remember that guy a hundred years ago who classified all of these other fossil spiders without silk glands as if they were spiders? He called them Mesothelids simply because they still had those plates. But if they were Mesothelids, then they would not only have had silk glands, they would have had spinnerets, too. So what looks to me like a pretty obvious error now was a perfectly reasonable conclusion back then, given the information available at the time. But if Chimerarachne had the first spinnerets, then true spiders, including Mesothelids, came from her lineage, the one that still had a tail, not from the other group that already lost him but couldn't make silk yet. We knew that true spiders already existed 100 million years before Chimerarachne, so this means that back then, some spiders that never developed silk had already lost their tails and that lineage went extinct. Then some silk-producing spiders split into two groups. Some lost their tails, leading to the modern forms that we know today, while another lineage persisted for quite a long time, keeping its tail until they went extinct, and that, of course, leads to these. Now, this new data reveals that the old analysis should be corrected, but it hasn't been. So if you search for the earliest mesothelids, you'll only get this guy's century-old assumption without amendment. And remember earlier in the series when we mentioned how an incomplete eurypterid fossil was once mistaken for a giant spider? When television producers discovered the error late in the production of a documentary, they tried to save the expensive CGI they had already done by changing the name from Megarachne to mesothelae, the oldest and most basal of all modern spiders. And they certainly look the part, don't they? So even though the BBC lied about there once being a spider the size of a cat, the truth is that mesothelae were and are real. There were different species of them then than we have now, but this shows how some transitional forms can still exist today. They don't always have to be extinct and known only from fossils. Again, it's funny to me when science denialists think that the spider is a species or a kind, and they say that spiders remained unchanged for 100 million years, except that this is what they looked like back then. And this is what they look like now. How long does it take for one species to become two? In the case of spiders, would that be a few thousand years? Probably, on average. If so, then it would take several thousand more years for those two to become four, and thousands more to become eight, and then 16, and so on, and on to become the 47,000 identified species of spiders alive today, taking into account how many of those went extinct along the way, thus taking even longer to reach that total. And that's to say nothing of the innumerable forerunners known only from a few rare fossils that are even more rarely well-preserved. 
such that it is fair to estimate that whatever we have left alive now represents less than 1% of everything that has ever lived. Of course, the more successful groups in terms of survival and especially reproduction will proliferate into the most varieties. And with enough variety, then there's a better chance that some of them would survive variable environmental dynamics, while the less adaptable forms and the lower performing ones would likely eventually thin out into extinction. This is the factor that drives the emergent improvement of features like fangs and venom and weaving better webs and so on. And this is probably why there are no more spiders that don't have fangs or that can't spin silk. So we've seen the evolution of arachnids leading to spiders, and now we'll see evolution within spiders. All the other living spiders that are not mesothelae are in a more derived sister group, opistothelae, which can be divided into two more subcategories, distinguished genetically and morphologically, particularly by the types of spinnerets that each group has. Notice how mesothelae has their oversized primitive spinnerets, not in the posterior position like all other modern spiders do, but in a median position on the underside of the abdomen. So what is the next most primitive type intermediate between these and the more derived forms? Megalomorphae, which actually means primitive. Although the first of these don't appear in the fossil record until the Middle Triassic, roughly 245 million years ago. They're easily recognizable by a visible pair of posterior lateral spinnerets. And like most clades, this one too is divided into at least two subcategories. Atipidae is seemingly more ancient according to morphology. This group includes things like trapdoor spiders and purse web spiders, some of which still retain a last vestige of their old inherited abdominal armor. The other group, Aviculoroidea, includes heavy-bodied brutes with massive downward-pointing saber teeth, monstrous things like funnel web spiders and tarantulas, including the largest spider in the world and the largest spider ever known to science, the Goliath bird-eating spider. The earliest known fossils of both of these groups are from the Triassic period, as early as 240 million years ago. There are three major categories of living spiders, and these first two primitive ones represent only a tiny percentage of what remains. There is more diversity in the third and most derived or advanced group, Araneomorpha, than in these first two groups combined. This illustration is a composite of a handful of collective molecular phylogenetic studies. Let's run through it for this last, but definitely not the least, group of spiders. The most primitive, or rather generalized, of these is the lampshade spiders and crevice spiders and coponiids that may have only two eyes, which is weird for an arthropod, or they could have four, six, or eight eyes. And then we have woodlouse spiders and tube dwellers, the infamous reclusive fiddle spider, and hundreds of species of spitting spiders that spit poisonous silk out of their mouths, just like that kaiju that fought Godzilla. How weird is that? Then we have coneweb spiders and several hundred species of cellar spiders and cave spiders, and velvet spiders, thousands of species of cobweb spiders like the black widow, brown widow, red widow, and Australian redback. Then we have tiny orb weavers and even pirate spiders who draw other spiders out of their webs and ambush them. Then we have long-jawed orb weavers, scaffold spiders, pimoa spiders, sheet web spiders, and giant orb weavers. I had a three-inch long orb weaver living on my back porch for a few months. It's too bad I had such a crappy camera back then because she was gorgeous and I enjoyed seeing her out there every day. A Jurassic fossil of a similar species in the same family is the largest fossil spider ever discovered. However, you might be surprised to know that it's not as big as some of the golden orb weavers are today. So you can throw out everything you were told in movies and on TV about giant prehistoric spiders. They had giant scorpions, that's true. But the spiders then were similar to what we have now, at least the ones that we found so far. Although a jungle environment doesn't often preserve fossils, so it's possible, and even probable, that there could have been something bigger way back when. Then we have another collection of smaller ornate orb weavers. At this time, think of Charlotte's Web. And there is also a subfamily that don't spin webs, and instead use their silk to make bolas to catch moths in flight. Then we've got disc web spiders, hackled orb weavers, ogre-faced spiders that catch their food in nets, and three-toed hackle mesh weavers and mesh web spiders, as well as the diving bell spider that uses its silk to create a scuba tank so that it can live underwater. Then we have dwarf sheet spiders, grass and hobo spiders, intertidal spiders, dusty desert spiders, and adorable jumping spiders, as well as ghost spiders, ground spiders, sack spiders, pretty crab spiders, lynx spiders, and wandering spiders. Fun fact! The venom of the wandering spider can cure erectile dysfunction. It can also kill you. And then we've got nursery web spiders as well as fishing spiders, the ones that run on water, and of course wolf spiders. And 
What's this? Pisoridae in part? The article explains that this is a paraphyletic grouping, but it's really polyphyletic, neither of which should happen in taxonomy anymore. In this case, it's where a single name was given to a collective that turned out to be two separate groups. They just didn't come up with a new name for that other group. It's not that hard to do. We just did it a few moments ago in this very video. And I was looking for giant huntsman spiders, but I see that their family, Sporacidae, isn't even listed here. There's more than a thousand species of huntsmen in temperate and tropical regions around the world, yet they didn't make the list. There's more than a dozen of them just in Australia alone. So I wonder what else is missing. I looked it up and I found 64 families representing 16,614 species that are not accounted for in this study. Because remember when I said in a previous episode of the series that no one has the time or money to do a genomic comparison of every species that is still alive? In this case, they can't do every genus or family either. There's too many. In fact, each of the families that were included in this study might be represented by the genome of a single species each, but it's enough to see a consistent pattern. So there you have the evolution of spiders, where their collective genomes and the fossil record and their embryological development align to tell you the same story of how they went from caterpillar-like things to an armored form, like a trilobite or a glaspid, where they differentiated the body into two parts and the head and thorax fused into one. Then they reduced the legs down to the first few pairs arranged in a radiating arachnomorph, and the front legs were reduced to chelicerae. Then they reduced the armor and built up the body, and then they started making silk and turned their chelicerae into fangs and finally lost their tails. And that is the tail of the spider.